All right. Hello, everybody. We finally, we finally got it made. Finally making our little video. It is about time. I'm sorry for the, the delay that I've had going on. I told you I was going to get this done before uh, Thanksgiving. Well, that's that's come and gone. But, uh... It's already hot. Not too long ago. It's just now into December, so... But, it's been, it's been busy around here. That's about right. So, we won't complain too much. Throw them all. Throw them over there. Okay. Anyways, a lot of great questions in here. I mean, lots of great questions. I can't thank you guys enough. I mean, just some... I think this is probably one of the, uh, going to be one of the better ones than, uh, that we've had in a while. Just, there's some really, really good questions in here. Like six pages, something like that. There's quite a few, so. Uh, yeah, I would have the front of the stove open, but, uh, sometime in the past week, I didn't realize it, I got a bird's nest in my... I know you can't see it, but the stove comes up, and it's got an L that comes forward and goes up. Well, that L's full of junk in there, and didn't realize it until I didn't have very good airflow coming out of it, and it was a little smoky in here, but that's all right. We'll just, we'll just get on to it. Uh, another thing, I've already had some fun comments uh, left on one of my videos. You can see there's a, there's a Trump sign. If you have a problem with that, then you just click off now, because uh, we're, this isn't a place for you. We're, uh, we're making America Cowboy again, and if you don't like that, then you just leave. So, it's the only one who actually seems like he halfway cares about some of us, so. Anyways, that's the end of that. Hope you got your coffee, or your beer, or if you're like me, you like your whiskey? Hope you got some of that too. And let's let's get to cracking on this deal. I'm gonna fill my cup up. So the first question is from Brian Hemp. Brian asks, "What happened with those fever tags? They interested me." Well, Brian, I have a, I have a box of them in here. So actually, I can I can see them right here. Uh, I had, I did a deal with the company, uh, or I bought these, you can see them right here, uh, these are unused, I don't remember how many I bought, uh, I think it was a hundred or something, and I know this was in last year's Saddle Shed video, uh, I think, but uh, I had about a hundred of them I bought, uh, it was they didn't work. Uh, that generation of them didn't work uh, as well as I would like for them to work. Uh, come to find out, like, they were having really good luck with them in Europe for, like, baby calves. You know, they're pulling off these dairies. Uh, because the thermometer was... We had some problems on those big calves where they'd pop out of the years. Uh, the, the housings for the thermometer would... Uh, the coating would break. Um, the battery was an issue. Needless to say, uh, the company, when I bought these, um, and I put them in, the, wasn't the manager, I think it was the owner of the company, called me. Their, uh, their manager just up and quit one day, went and got a different job. So, he kind of got thrown into it. Uh, I'm sure they own more than just that company. And so he was kind of trying to figure out everything that was going on. Talked to me. Really nice guy. Um, and he talked about how they knew of some of the issues. But 
they didn't have anyone who was really kind of sending it back to them in the application that we were using them in. So we uh, talked back and forth a couple times. Um, and I never got my tags, my broken tags, sent back to them. My fault. You know, things go on. I didn't have to pay for my tags. Um, the guy was just like, hey, you know, tell us everything that you're having wrong with them. We're not going to make you pay for the tags. Uh, I didn't ask for that to happen. I just, he happened to contact me and, and we got to talking about it. And I told him, you know, hey, this is, you know, what I found. And I, I think they're a great idea. I really do. Uh, and I, I just never got them sent back. I don't think he owns the company anymore. I don't know. I don't know where they're at, honestly. Uh, they had a couple different generations coming out as soon as, you know, I had that one. Uh, I don't know if I can even show these. This is a, this is a different company. Uh, I know there's no names on it. The blue ones are temp tags. So, different company, different ideas. Uh, that's a project that I'm really not working with. It's my wife. She's kind of doing something with that. Um, and if you, in the video where you saw the yellow box out there, that's, that's all part of that deal. So there's another project, and, uh, if I can, hopefully if I can talk to you about it and, and share some information, if I ever get to see any information on it, um, I'll, I'll just completely discuss that with you, because I, I think there's a lot of, this one has a lot of, like, neat things about it that I'd like, um, Long term, see what happens with it. You know, I think there's a lot of cool technology out there that we could use, uh, but it has to be usable and uh, has to be affordable too. So that's where that's at. Uh, just kind of a dead end on the deal. Uh, it's been long enough. I'm, you know, if they ever call me, yeah, that's one thing. But I, uh, I'm not currently at a spot where I kind of want to pursue that when I have this other stuff here and and it's it's kind of one of those deals um, interesting outfit I'll say that so the next one's from Derry Halverson uh, if I butcher your name sorry it happens people butcher my last name all the time do you ever buy options on cattle as a marketing tool and if so have you Traditionally had reasonable success in doing so. Um, sometimes, uh, it, well, as far as uh, a marketing tool, no, I don't buy options to market the cattle because uh, that's I w I wouldn't even know how you would get into that. I know you you know fat cattle uh, they you can force delivery if you have sold an option on those cattle but usually people it I don't usually doesn't that's not a doesn't happen very much but it it is a thing that can happen as far as me no that's that's not something I've ever uh, dealt with uh, not as a marketing tool I've I have kind of messed with it to kind to uh, protect my uh, protect my bottom line and I have had some some luck that way but uh it's hit and miss Grant Smith what what is your uh do you uh enjoy most about having cattle sometimes <laughs> Sometimes you kind of read, read through these. Well, I'm I'm sure it's what do you what do you enjoy uh, most about having cattle, uh, cow calf backgrounding farming. Uh, I like the cow calf. That that's where I'm at. That's that's my favorite thing. Uh, that's that's really just kind of what I enjoy the most. Uh, the backgroundings. I mean, it's, it's got its days where it's really fun, and it's got its days where it's just, it's not fun. Uh, but that's, every job's that way. Uh, farming, I, I'm not a big 
That's not my thing. That's, there's other people who like that. Okay, Montgomery Livestock. Just wanted to ask how you decide if you're using a round baler or a square baler. Uh, a lot of it just kind of depends on the application. Uh, uh, if, we're, if we know we're going to grind the hay uh, and it's a, a longer stem, you know, we'd probably run a round baler. Uh, square, you know, if it's a product that we want to sell, square baler. For the most part, uh, uh, do the square baler on some stuff just because it's faster. Uh, if we're going to do a lot of like round bale slicing or hay ring feeding or tub grinding on round baler, uh, but you know, it's just kind of just kind of however. It, However it is, if we have some that we want to flake in the pasture, a square bale would be nice, but it's it's all just kind of, you know, the type of hay and what, what we think we might be able to do with it. How many tons do you feed per day? Uh, probably anywhere between 16 to 20 tons of feed a day. Brax or that was Jeremy V who asked that. Uh, Braxton Huey, um, what is your favorite breed of cattle? Uh, I I'm a big black mott. That's I like you know a, a cross between your Angus and your Hereford. I uh, like your your F1 crosses. I I'm I'm a big fan of that. I I have my oddballs that I like like my uh, my Bramers. I like my oddballs, but uh, I'm a big F1 cross. That's that's kind of my favorite. We got Casey CRB. When processing new calves, what do you use and what weights do you buy at to get the highest, fastest gains? Most profitable return on your money. Oh, that's, you know, it's an interesting question because it's usually... Uh, you're trying to find um, what kind of animal is going to make your dollar go further. Um, short little short calves, they don't, they take longer to feed, their cost of gains usually higher. Um, calves coming off cows that are fat, you know, they're going to lose their baby fat and, and they're going to be fleshy. Well, you got to you know, you're buying fat and not frame. Uh, really, kind of the best thing I found is a, a, a real, like a six weight frame calf that's weighing like 480. You know, some, some you know, just, just all real framey. Because uh, they will eat you out of house and home and they will convert feed really quickly. Uh, what's most profitable? Man, I wish if I knew that I'd. I would be buying a lot more cattle than I am. But that's uh as far as processing, um, you know, your feed is as much as anything as you're gonna give them. I I, I think as far as the health on the cattle, but uh you know, calves that we don't know any history about typically uh we'll give them like in a nasal gen IBR like Enforce Three, um, it's kind of hit and miss whether we'll mass them or not with like Draxon or Zaprevo or something like that. A lot of times we will, sometimes we won't. And we'll wish we had, and sometimes we do it and wish we hadn't done it. Um, but uh, you know, we'll, I some of them I give multi men to. I can't tell difference. Uh, mainly, a, you know, a good warmer, a good IBR, and um, if they have no known history, you know, a seven way, and thing, usually I'll implant them. But uh, just try to really cover your bases. I know I'm missing something. Cole Dickinson, do you use any of Bud Williams' marketing or suckmanship techniques? Uh, I don't know what his marketing techniques are. Um, suckmanship techniques, I don't... 
I don't know, uh, probably, but it wasn't because I, it wasn't anything I picked up from watching a, a seminar or, or anything that he had, people had copied from him and put on. Uh, I, I had a class in college where uh, the professor was really up on him, and it just, most of it honestly is just common sense, you know, uh, when, when they start having to show diagrams to the class about, you know, where to stand on which side of the, the, the cow to get it to move, um, pretty interesting, but, you know, you also, as a kid, you know, you get, <laughs> you get yelled at when, uh, every time you take a wrong step, you get to, uh, you either learn to read a cow or you, you just learn to get yelled at a lot, and uh, I don't know which one I picked up, but I didn't uh, really didn't kind of pick it up from a class. So I wish I could tell you more about that. But the class that I did take, it was interesting. I'll give you that. It was it was an interesting deal. But um, there's a lot of merit to what they have to say. Um, a lot of it's just take what they show you and apply it to the situation and and try to learn from that don't don't do it just because a book tells you you know try to you you kind of kind of you got to learn to read them also could you teach on wheat pasture i'm curious about how you go about it when you turn out how long uh typically you can turn out on wheat as early as you can take the plant and like pull it and not pull the roots up with it so you can go pretty early uh we like to have pretty good growth on it uh and then i usually pull all the cattle off by march uh because we, we don't ever graze out just for the fact some of our fields have alfalfa in them and then uh, we we want a hay crop off of it you know that's that pays the bills so uh, it's pretty good deal if you have it. I mean, especially if you're not having to irrigate, it's a great deal. And you have wheat. Uh, good way to put pounds on cattle. So, I took care of that one. And you can see all my smoke rolling out. I'm just going to leave this down here. Okay. Uh, the, there was actually a, a reply to that by Derry Halverson. And he added to that question, if we had ever had any bloat issues with cows or calves on tall regrowth. Um, it's a possibility. Uh, I haven't ever had it when I turn them out. Uh, but we grow a lot of triticale and it's not as bad. Uh, a lot of people here will either put Tide in the water, like uh, soap. I got mice in one of the feed bags I hear running around. Um, or put out like wheat straw bales or, you know, some kind of uh, bales to kind of uh, get a lot of dry matter. Because that's the big thing is getting, getting some dry matter into them. We don't have a lot of issues because... We had the corners around our circles or old grass pastures, so there's grass out there too. So they'll, you know, they'll go and graze on the wheat and then graze on the grass, and it's a good, good mix into it. So not an issue I've had. However, like I said, in the springtime, uh, some of them have alfalfa, and that first flush up, I've had it just drop calves when I really couldn't afford for that to happen. So that uh, lesson I learned. Cody Ryan, uh, he gets the rude question of the of the show. How many cows do y'all own y'all self? That's, I mean, that's how it's on there, y'all self. Um, that's kind of like asking somebody, you know, how much money they have in the bank. It's just a really rude question. You don't ask people that. Someone offers that information, you know. That one and how many acres do you have? I get, that's get that one all the time. How many acres do you have? <laughs> it's just kind of a, uh, and, and a lot of it's just ignorance, like, you know, that people don't know, but 
know, it, that, it is just a rude question. Oh, Charlie from down in New Mexico is congratulating us on finally getting fiber. So I'll probably put this on my computer and it'll be up in 10 minutes. Um, if you didn't know these videos, if I didn't have an issue, it would take mm, probably a good 20 hours to upload an hour long video. Uh, that's if we didn't have an issue and have to redo it all over again. So <laughs> it's been pretty nice. <clears throat> if we'd had fiber for a long time, I probably wouldn't have gotten so slow on making videos. Uh, just in case says, nice looking group of calves. Uh, thanks. Well, DLK, hey. On average, how long are your backgrounded calves on the ranch for? Uh, well, the calves that we keep on the grass... Uh, which be our, our own personal calves. I don't turn any custom cattle out or anything like that. I just put my own custom or my own ranch calves back out and I'll feed them out there. And I actually like that a lot more, more than putting them in the pen. I uh, really like that a lot more. But, uh, you know, I think usually at the most, probably 120 days, so four months. And that's just, just because of weight. Uh, you know, you're figuring. At two pounds a day, that's 200, 240 pounds. They're probably going to do a little better than that. So, you know, you know some of those calves are going to be 260, 300. Uh, but if you figured... So, <clears throat> on your small calves, that's going to get you to seven. On your big calves, that's going to get you to eight. <clears throat> and that's where we really like to move them. So, that's about the longest they're here. Or they stay here. Um, calves that get shipped in could be anywhere from... 30 days to, you know, same deal, 120 days. It just kind of really depends on on what somebody wants to do. And uh, we're all about making people happy because that's how we pay. That's how we, that's, YouTube's not supporting us too well. Uh, Sunset Farms, what goes into your ration and what kind of grains, or what kind of gains do you get out of it? Uh, typically, right, we've switched to, uh, we haven't had corn silage, we had some last year, but I've uh, kind of gone to wheat litch, uh, a ground hay, uh, dried distiller grains, um, either cracked corn or rolled corn, and then a, um, a balancer pellet, so it has our mineral pack and our, our uh, remincing in it. Because uh, we, we do use an ionophore. Uh, we'll use uh, a liquid in the ration, uh, either water for our conditioning, and then uh, I still I use Mix 30 in there. I like the energy in it, especially for little calves. Because we're, we're doing so many fresh calves all the time uh, that we do stay constant with just pretty constant on one ration, you know, one size fits all. Typically, uh, we don't. We try to make it easy because we, we have a lot of other stuff going on. I, I know we've looked at doing rations for just the fresh calves and then the other calves, and when we did that, it uh, we did that before we were on performance beef. Now that we're on performance beef, it probably probably work great. Uh, be really really easy to do that because we're we have we can set all that up and run our our rations that way but uh I, I'm just happy with where we're at and, I, and I'm happy with how the calves are doing it you know that's the big thing is they're healthy and they come on to feed and they do good and you know don't really want to mess that up as far as gains go uh, the ration we're currently running I uh, I had backed it off uh, we're two two and a half pounds a day tip probably two and a quarter um, and that's uh, because the problem is you know uh, it is more expensive to do that um, than running them hotter at three pounds a day but the problem you run into three pounds a day is uh, they'll start carrying some fat and you can you can get docked pretty good on that deal, and, and it's just not worth it. We have a better quality calf this way. 
better looking calf and, and a, definitely a more desirable calf. So if there's something you can do in the long run, I, I think it's a better deal. And we have to really be careful here anyway because we, you know, we're feeding in the winter time and, and we are cold here. And so the cattle do feed um, really well. And then we hit that like second, third week of March when all of a sudden we hit 70 degrees. And the cattle, you can really see it. I mean, time after time is all of a sudden these calves that are up 700 pounds, they've been using all this energy staying warm. And now it's warm and they go straight to fat. And I mean, just like that and then I mean, you can have good perfect calves and then you can have fatties and it's so it's something we kind of really kind of backed our, our uh, ration back just just to try to prevent that as much as possible so landmark cattle it's got the next one do you have much trouble with oh I'm gonna mispronounce this uh, Practically somnus in your incoming cattle. Um, not really. I mean, it's not. Um, and it could just be something I, I'm not really seeing. But it's not. Not really an issue that we've had. If it was an issue, it'd be more out of our. Uh, our shipped in calves coming out of uh, the the east than it would be because you know everyone here is actually for the most part not everybody but for the most part people here are pretty good about working their calves and getting them what they need whereas and not bash anybody back east but you have a lot of you know five cows or two cows or ten cows or you know where they just take, yank the calves off the cow and straight to the sale barn and that that's just what they are and that's where you're going to see a lot of that issue and you see that issue here however since we do uh, most people brand here or everybody in New Mexico has to brand it's not an option you know, it's it is the state law. You have to brand your cattle. They cannot be here uh, any more than 30 days without a brand on them. So if you go through the step of branding them, then typically they will have something in them. Uh, Texas is county by county, but you don't have to brand in Texas. And so, uh, you know, you, you see some of that and then some of the other states but typically if there's a if there's a really good brand uh, brand law then then you'll see you'll see some cattle that have at least at least a seven way in them which isn't much but it, it's something and typically they're usually all all steers but not always okay then we got fifth gen how is the How's the receiving shed working out a few years in? I keep wondering if you have plans to put up a second one next to the current one. A couple of videos you have done where the new loads are getting used to the weather after a long truck ride. Uh, so we've learned a lot about having a shed. Uh, I've learned tremendous things about having a shed. Um, I, as far as a second one, I thought about it. I really did think about it. Uh, but I need currently, I mean, I could always build another one. Currently, I need more receiving pins. I don't need another receiving barn. Uh, so, or I actually have all the bunk bought and we, <laughs> we just got to get it done. Uh, to put in a, a pin right next to it, another receiving pin. That's what we really need. Uh, the barn itself works fantastic. Uh, works extremely well. The thing we have found about it, and there's some coffee grounds, is uh, number one, 
Well, we knew it had to be cleaned. I mean, it, that's just one thing. It, it's got to be cleaned. Uh, we were always really proactive about that. Um, we always lime it, clean the water. Uh, occasionally, I'll go through and just spray everything with Clorox, and that actually works a lot better than a person would think. Uh, but I mean, I run it pretty hot. Uh, it's practically 50% Clorox with a little garden sprayer. I've done that. That works great. Uh, but we'll lime it. Uh, you wouldn't think that we it would get uh, like muggy here uh, and damp, but under that barn, I mean, just all that humidity is under that barn, and so we you got to keep good dry bedding in it, and th that was something I never really had an issue with. Um, but you can see it; you can really tell when it starts getting just a little too damp in there. Uh, and then a lot of it depends on the cattle that go in there. So, native cattle can go in that thing, um, and, and they do fantastic. Like, if you're getting ready to wean a set of calves, and it's really amazing. That's the thing we've, I've really learned about this thing, is you can have a couple different sets of calves, native calves, that come off this ranch, and if, if there's some kind of weather coming in, and you put that one set under the barn and one set out from under the barn, you'll doctor the ones that didn't go into the barn. The ones that went under the barn, you just never have to touch them. Ever. Ever, ever, ever. Uh, unless you put like a hundred in there, like I do sometimes. Then, typically, and why you'll have to doctor something in there is because they are in such close proximity to each other. Because it, I mean, it's not very, it's not huge. It is a nice barn. Uh, but you'll, you'll have to, you get a lot more, uh, the ground will get a lot damper. And you'll see a snotty noser, or, or you'll get a calf that actually gets sick, and you'll have to doctor that, that one. If you don't overpack it, you don't have to touch them. Um, and then the calves that, but, the calves are outside, and then same cows, same, you'll have to doctor those. Like, and I'm talking about really, really rough weather. Cold rain after they've been weaned, something like that, you know, something that's just absolutely not a good thing. Um, shipped in calves, that's a, uh, well, I, we'll go back to the native calves. The native calves can stay and this will tie into it. Native calves can stay in there for a month, two months, you know. You can actually use it for an actual feed pen and not have a problem with it. The shipped in calves is where you get into an issue. And that's something that we really kind of learned with it. As I was shipping those calves in, and it was, it was, uh, you know, it was just really tough conditions. And the calves were never hardening up. The, they're never getting hard. Um, <laughs> that's what she said. Uh, and you, I mean, you'd always have to be putting uh, bedding down. Lost my train of thought. But uh, and they would just continue to get sick. So, and that's why I'm not building a second one. Is because what we ended up having to do is if we had. Uh, snow blowing through or some other kind of thing make sure there's not a problem somewhere nope uh, or cold rain and that's originally why we built it because in the winter time we can get you know cold rain and then snow on top of it and it'll that's a cattle killer I mean it will just decimate shipped in calves uh, but we learned that those calves they can go under that barn into a, a weather event like that, you know, for a couple of days, three, four, five days a week. But as soon as that weather's over, those cattle need to come out of that barn. And they need to go into a feed pen, open air feed pen, because they they don't ever, you know, get used to our climate. And they will just continually get sick and continually get sick and continually get sick. Because they're going to, that type of calf is going to get sick anyways. 
But what happens if they stay under that bar, no matter how clean you keep it, is they'll continually get sick. But it's, I mean, it's it's nice and cozy in there, and they just don't ever get past it. And uh, they don't ever toughen up. And that's one thing we really learned with it. It's, it's, it's a great tool. Um, but if you don't use it right, I mean, it, I, I definitely learned a lot of lessons about it. You know, our native calves are, they're hardened by our climate already. So you put them under it, you can use it as a feed pan and not have any issues like you would with a shipped in calf. And, uh, and you know, there's going to be diseases in there, in that soil that you're never going to get out. But you're taking calves, fresh calves, that aren't used to the diseases that are in a feed yard off the ranch and putting them in there and not having any issues with them because we do have a good vaccination program but you take shipped in calves put them in there and it, it's just a constant struggle with them uh, so that that's the thing with it is you gotta use it's it's a tool and you have to use that tool appropriately so it's you know, it's kind of those things like, well, this is going to solve every problem. Well, it created problems while solving problems. So uh, now that we kind of have a really good grasp on it, you know, it, it's one of those things. I try to keep that barn, uh, I try to not have it cattle in it. Uh, this time of year, it, it just has cattle in it because we don't have enough feed pens uh, at all anymore. Uh, we're just full. Um, and I actually have a set of calves in there right now that uh, we did, we cleaned the barn up, bedded it. Uh, calves came out of Arizona. They're they're acting like our native calves. They're just they're doing really good. So I'm pretty happy with them. But they came in out of southern Arizona, and it was naturally is snowing. Uh, so it's like, well, let's get them under here because it was snowing. Then it's supposed to be windy and cold and. One of those kind of deals. All right, so Drew Bray, do you market your home raised calves with purchased calves or separate? We do not commingle our calves whatsoever. Uh, no, that's that's a big no no. I mean, I, I know people do it for me personally. No, I I don't use the same color ear tags. I try not to even sell them on the same days. I don't want that stuff that I buy even close to what we raise. I just, you know, I, I just, that's, for me, no. What we raise, we take pride in what we raise, really try to make sure it's a good quality calf. I don't want some swamp rat that I've bought because it was cheap anywhere in the same building as what I raise. It's just, uh, we do not co-mingle. Uh, I have some lesser quality cows. I have a few colored calves on our really good cows. I will take those colored calves out of that group of calves and I'll take some really good calves of mine that are blacks and I'll just swap them out that way like our, our ranch calves are 100% black, you know, same bulls, um, same, everything's the same. I don't feel bad about doing that because I made a better product. Uh, but I, I do not mess around with that. It's, um, even on these cows, uh, I buy cows every year and calve them out and run them. Uh, I won't even mix those calves with our, our ranch calves because I don't, you know, I don't know what bull was with those cows. I don't know the history of those cows. I won't even mix those. I calved them and fed them and raised them and worked them. They all work the same, but I, to me, that's not the same. So, hope that helps. Uh, to uh, Barrick. Just saying, uh, really loves the channel, would love to do business with us. So, yeah. 
Hit us up. It wouldn't be the first person. It's uh, very strange when someone finds you off YouTube, but, uh, you know, it's... Uh, I've had several people now. Uh, there's there's some good people out in the world, and it's it's uh, interesting to think that somebody found you off something you put out there, but that's I guess that's why we put it out there. Share what we've learned. Share what I've learned. Braxton Huey. I think he already answered one. Maybe not. I know the last name is the same. Uh, would you ever consider Case or New Holland equipment? Oh, yeah. It, I would. I mean, it's... I actually... Uh, several times I've looked at buying a uh, New Holland tractor, you know, loader and grapple, because, uh, you know, they were quite a bit cheaper last time I kind of priced them they weren't. Uh, and these were new. I was looking at new ones. Uh, as far as hay equipment... Uh, you know, for the longest time we just didn't have a dealer to work on them. Uh, and even the... There is a dealer, uh, but... It's our feed mixer company. I uh, don't, you know, they don't know how well. I know they're, they're selling tractors. So, it's, you know, it really comes down to what, what's the price on it. And that's, we got to make it pay for us. But, and can we get it worked on? Uh, Will Stradler. He said, could you talk a little bit about the history of your operation? Uh, well, honestly, we've been... We've been in New Mexico since 1904. Um, at least. Uh, they were... Uh, the... My... Dad's grandfather, so my great-grandfather, homesteaded this place. Um... And his, he drilled wells, um, and his father came and had a, uh, he had a, uh, homestead too, so it had been my great-great-grandfather had a homestead here. Uh, my house here, actually this, uh, this building right here is on the original 160 acres, um, but they homesteaded in 1906, uh, before... Ran cows, you know, cow calf. Before that, they had a ranch in Jacksboro, Texas, uh, where they raised horses for the cavalry. Um, for the Union cavalry, and before that, it was for, you know, before that, it was the Confederate cavalry. And then they, uh, actually, uh, one of my one of my dad's uncles, you know, did went back and did a lot of family research. Uh, my family was here before the Revolutionary War. There was actually, uh, they came over and they built, uh, they farmed and built churches. Uh, they came, they landed in, they came to Georgia, and uh, they had, uh, the man had 13 sons. So they had a bunch of kids that actually, they all fought in the Revolutionary War. Uh, and they all stayed in the South, um, had a plantation in Mississippi, and from Mississippi they went to Texas, and, uh, from Texas they came here, there was a few of them that went up into Oklahoma for a little bit, and had a saloon up the hit up there, but, uh, you know, this is, this is kind of the end of the road, um, really, so. I went through Jacksboro a couple of times, and I was down there. You know, there's oil wells everywhere, and you're just kind of like, man, why, why, why did you sell that ranch? But uh, yeah, the uh, actually the not not the uncle that did uh, the genealogy, uh, but his brother, my my other great uncle, he actually uh, he was born in 1902. And when he was 10 years old, 1912, they, uh, they left here because they still had, um, quite a few horses in the, the Texas Panhandle. 
and they gathered the rest of them up and drove them. Uh, I don't remember which army fort it was and finished selling those horses. And uh, then they went down to Mexico and got a bunch of cattle and, and uh, did some stuff with them. But uh, they procured a bunch of cattle in Mexico. But yeah, and so then once that ran, they sold that ranch, and from here they from there they came here and uh, put in drilled a lot of windmills, put up a lot of windmills, and stuck it out through the 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 drought. And now it's uh, now it's me, and my kid. So fun times. That's kind of. That's just kind of where it's at. So, Larry Thompson. Uh, and maybe it, I can probably do some more videos on that. I mean, it, I think there's there's a lot I can I can share about it. Uh, uh, there's uh, there's a lot of fun stories I I heard uh, that just uh, about all the people who lived here who uh, home who homesteaded here, which they're all long gone now. But, you know, they're little rock piles out in the pastures. And, uh, you know, no nobody alive knows knows about them now. But I just have a lot of stories about uh, some of those people. And, and for every every family that I know a story about, there's, there's probably five or six that I... It's a rock pile, which is kind of sad, but that's just how life is. Especially, especially during what they went through. So, we'll, we'll move on to Larry Thompson's question. Wish there were more videos, but there are only so many hours in a day. I've always enjoyed your channel for quite a while. The good, the bad, the ugly. So, really appreciate that. Really, really do appreciate it. out. Dan Whiteford, do you have a preference on any breed, crossbreed, or sex when buying cattle? What about a uh, castrates versus entire bulls? Uh, like I said before, it really comes down to the price and uh, where you can make the money. And what time of year? You know, that's another thing that plugs into it. You know, uh, here, feeder heifers and July, late July, August are pretty hot commodity. So if you can buy really cheap heifers early and get them to that point, you know, then that's something you want to do. Uh, sometimes bulls always sound cheaper shipped in, but I don't think they are because uh, number one, they don't. They don't go on and gain very well because either they're so rough when they get here that you ban them and then you just have a huge problem or, you know, coming out of the south, I mean, they're looking like herd bulls already. So if you, you cut them open, that's a pretty big wound to get a lot of infection and stuff from the soil, regardless of whether, oh, I don't want to ban it or I only pocket cut them, you know, cut them with my knife. Uh, you open it up, there is a possibility for infection. Uh, we used to castrate all of our calves off our cows with a pocket knife. Uh, I use a little green bander because it's really quick and we can run a lot of cattle. Uh, still know how to do it, but uh, as far as the feed yard stuff, I prefer a bander. Um, if you have time to let those calves set when they first get here, get them past their respiratory issues. You know, three, four weeks, get them good and clean and strong. Then I think you should ban them, because the calves that come in that you just do it day one or you know that first week. Not only are you fighting them, the respiratory issues, then you're fighting the fact that they don't want to eat, they don't want to get up. You know, they're just they're not having a good time. So, uh, as far as what breed, I don't have a preference. Uh, I don't want a Longhorn. I don't want a Brahmer, you know, a Bramer. 
I promise. Uh, because they don't sell. You know, they're going to dock this shit out of you here. Uh, and you see that. I mean, there's a reason why they're cheap. Because you're going to get docked on it. But, uh, I buy a lot of heifers because they're cheap. And I can buy more of them. I don't gain as good. And you can get kind of stuck with them sometimes. But, you can... I think they kind of work a little bit better for me. What cattle diseases do you, uh, this is from Mike Nicholson. What cattle diseases do you worry about running so many cattle through your yards? I mean, your biggest one is your BRD. I mean, that's just, and you're going to, any yard. Um, I mean, that's just a big problem. It's always been a problem. It's probably always going to be a problem. We see a lot of uh, positive results. If you've vaccinated your calves, and then you've revaccinated your calves three weeks before you wean them, four, three, four weeks before you wean them, huge results, huge. Um, it just it is night and day different. What happens when those cattle have a vaccine? Uh, weaned versus un, you know weaned calves, man. That's that's. That's great. That makes that makes my job easy. Uh, but don't, pe people don't send me calves that are easy. People, I mean, that's, that's why you send them to a backgrounder because it's uh, either you don't got the room for them yourself, or uh, you don't have the time to doctor them all yourself because you're busy doctoring calves already. So, and uh, unweaned calves, you know, they get BRD running through them. It's it's a mess. Um, you get mycoplasma. That's a that sucks. I mean, there's not anything you can do about it, really. Uh, that's a bad one. Uh, most stuff's pretty. As long as as long as you have a drug that can help the BRD, that's about all you can hope for. But that's that's a big one. So uh, this year we saw. I I've seen more mycoplasma this year. Uh, than I have in a couple years. Uh, I've seen it in quite a few calves. There's just not really anything we can do it. Uh, I've seen some coccidiosis this year. Haven't seen that in a while. Um, but yeah. So it is me personally. What I you know I just try to keep the pins clean and you know stay on top of it. Uh, don't just keep giving the same drug. Especially if you're not getting the results, you know, you're just going to beat your head against the wall. Uh, you know, try combinations of drugs. And then, uh, since I do have other pins that aren't right here in at this feedlot, um, you know, I, I do have to bring a lot of cows here in preg check. And I do wean some calves here, but I try... I try to either put them in pens I haven't had a lot of calves in or clean pens. And I do try to separate as much as I can. I don't always get that done. But I try to. And, uh, because that, we have shipped so many calves through here now, it is an issue. I mean, it's, you're going to have that anywhere. So we, we know what's here. TNR Red Angus. Was hoping we would continue the series. Uh. That's a great guy. Good channel. Older fellow. Uh, if you don't subscribe to him, go watch TNR Red Angus. He's a really cool guy. Uh, up there in North Dakota. Gary West. Hey, Will. Always enjoyed the Saddle Shed series. He just put three S's with you. Where or what are you hearing as far as prices recovering in the cattle industry? Uh, I'm not hearing much. Uh, I don't know. It's, you know, who knows? It's, uh, it's after Thanksgiving, you know, now they're talking about, uh, live cattle are going to go down because, you know, box beef is going down because everything's already bought up for Christmas parties. Um, uh, you know, feeder cattle were up. Uh, they started going down today. I think they went under $1.40 today on the futures, so... Really, I'm personally, I'm just hoping to get them marketed somewhere around that dollar forty mark, dollar thirty for my heifers. I'm just 
praying to get somewhere close to that and just kind of try to just get on through to the next year because it's you know, we're in a drought we don't have any grass you know it's just uh just trying to get get through because um, it hadn't been great you know if we were up that dollar 65 that'd be that would be nice but it's not dustin adams what became of your hay barn after it got wrecked fixed or replaced um well our massey ferguson after it got totaled uh went to my insurance company they they totaled it out because by the time you replaced the header and dry pumps and oh it, it was just a it was a mess once you started really getting into it i mean it went, didn't look so bad in the pictures except for everything was bent and they didn't make that style merger anymore and it's just would you when you hit a uh, steel in place in concrete stock tank at 14 miles an hour and you launch a swather over it and then hang it on the back axle and swing it around and bend the tank it messes a lot of shit up so we don't own it anymore uh not well it will be replaced but uh that was such a long deal that happened you know first of july or last day of june uh didn't didn't get a uh rental until august and took it back september and you know we're that's the end of our year so uh we won't won't mess with anything till the spring then we'll go from there but yeah we don't have that one no more so uh it's a bit of a deal so but you know so I have insurance and things happen. That's I stressed about it enough. Rob Coons or Coonsy, how do you find people to precondition Kez for? I know you do a lot of preconditioning and put frame on Kez instead of fat, but I was always curious how you found the people to send you cattle. Thanks a bunch. Uh Rob, I you know I've, it, that, that's something I've kind of also, you know, the hay deal. It, it seems like people have found me. I'm, I'm probably the absolute worst example of anybody. Um, because I, anytime I go to do something, you know, I, I have had zero experience in preconditioning cattle or feeding cattle or anything. But I just decided I was going to do it and, you know, for my own personal reasons for the ranch and stuff like that. And so I went forward and did it and, you know, it, you know, then all of a sudden, you know, then you have a little feed lot and you're doing that. And you're like, hey, you know, you one guy calls and say, hey, do you have open pens and you want to take care of some cattle? And thank God that guy called when he did because I was broke. And, uh, you know, the rest was history, but, uh, <laughs> took care of the first year. First year we did 500 head. Didn't lose a single one. That was, don't know how that happened. It's never going to happen again. Uh, it's beginner's luck. And, uh, I, I feel like we were, I was on top of them just as much as I'm on top of them now. And... You know, I, they didn't like how high our feed was. They liked how we took care of the cattle. And, you know, the next year it was a rude awakening because it didn't matter who you were. Cattle were dying everywhere. And, boy, that first one died. And it was... I kind of had my hum head hung pretty low. And it... Then the next one died. Then the next one. Then the next dump truck load. Then the next dump truck load. And... Boy, but you know everybody. I mean, it was everybody. It was just a bad year. Everyone was losing cattle. It was horrible. Um, but yeah, it's uh, 
I was always honest. Uh, I've, I've been accused of being very depressing because I always, I always tell them how bad it is. Uh, and so it's usually, it's usually not as bad. And so I, I don't, I don't try to make things uh, all sunshine and rainbows. So if you find somebody, you know, and, and find, I had to call people who were doing it to get prices and, uh, yeah, but, uh, I'm going to swap cameras. All right. I, uh, it's cold and my battery died. So I had swapping, swapping over to this one. We'll see if it works. Uh, so yeah, uh, that's what you know. It, it was it was a tough deal, but I've always tried to be honest in everything I'm doing. I, I don't want to be a person who's dishonest. Uh, I I've never been dishonest, and and honestly, a lot of people uh, a lot of people don't like you for that. Uh, they don't like you telling them how it is. Uh, just straightforward. Uh, be very blunt about things. Uh, you lose a lot of friends that way. But anyways, so people ask, you know, might have asked him about me and, you know, hey, his feed's high or his feed has come down. You know, they either do a good job or don't do a good job. It's all word of mouth. Uh, then we had another guy who sent me Kev's, you know, same deal. Did a couple loads for him. It, no one was ever as big as the, the first guy. Uh, had another guy, another neighbor who, uh, you know, they're really happy. Uh, the, those Kev's, the Kev's they sent me are, they're, they're high risk Kev's. You know, I mean, it's, you, you can get yourself. They're sometimes pretty rough deal, but you know, that's, uh, that's what they are. Um, we just do it, you know, we always do everything we can to take care of the cattle. I always take care of the cattle like they're my own. And most of the time I take care of them better than my own because for some reason I just feel this responsibility that if you're going to send me cattle, I better, better take care of them. Because I really don't care what people think about me, or I wouldn't definitely wouldn't be doing YouTube. Uh, but the one thing I do care about is if somebody says I'm bad at taking care of cattle. That's that's probably the only thing I, uh, that would bother me if someone said that. Um, and it wouldn't be because someone was saying it, it's because I've been yeah, am I doing a bad job? You know, I need, I need to change something. Because uh, that's, I mean, that's a business I'm in. So, it's, you know, I, I really wouldn't know how you would go about finding people to send you cattle. I mean, you could advertise it. I, I did, I think I put out an ad one time, but, you know, I mean, it's, uh, and I thought about putting out an ad, but really happy with the customers I currently have. And, and this is just a, this, this whole business just happened, just, it just happened. Because I, I built this to feed our own calves, to make sure we at least got to break even on calves. You know, after the inflated cow price and, and everything, and that, that was the big thing. It's always try to make sure we weren't going to lose money. And just the fact that. It has evolved into what it is now where we have to have an employee and we need more pins. It's, uh, it's something else. It's, I like doing it, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, as long as we can take care of them, that I'll, I'll be okay. You know, that's, if it gets to the point where we can't handle it, then I, I'm going to back off and, and, uh, because this, we want to make sure that, you know, we're doing a good job for the ones we have. There's There's been a few times where cattle have just rolled in and rolled in and rolled in and you, you kind of 
clicks in the back of your mind. You're like, you know, am I going to get bit on this deal? And, uh, but that just really makes me just go that much further and work that much longer to make sure that we can take care of them. And I've always, I haven't hit to the, hit a point where, uh, there's only one point where I thought I might be in over my head, but I didn't have an employee. It was a load of fresh calves in the fall. I was trying to bail corn stalks and, and they were all breaking at the same time. And, you know, they were small calves and it was, uh, we just, Reagan was like a month old and, you know, I was, I was having, I was working past midnight every night and it was just, that was one of those points where I kind of, I couldn't stop what I was doing financially or just want, you know, or just because I wanted to, because it, uh, just, there just wasn't, that's, that wasn't an option. So, but, uh, you know, it, it just, what, what happened is instead of, instead of being able to do like the bailing and, and the, and the hauling the corn stalks and stuff like that, because we desperately need them for the cows, this is a couple of years ago, uh, you know, it was feed all the cattle and then you take care of the cattle. And it doesn't matter if it took all day or not. Uh, we doctored, I doctored, it was just me. Uh, I doctored those cattle until, you know, if I got done by two in the afternoon or three in the afternoon or 4.30 when it got dark, the cattle were always taken care of first. And, and I think if you're gonna do this as a, as a business, that's, that's the motto you have to go by. The cattle come first. Um, and then I would go work after dark until you know after midnight or one in the morning hauling corn stalks uh so we could feed our cows on the ranch and yeah it's makes it hard having an employee because you know they're not gonna do that they're gonna go home when it gets dark anyways i'll get off on a trail on that one uh but yeah, so if you, any takeaway out of this whole, any video I've ever made, cattle come first. That's just how it is. Cattle come first. And it, if, if you're going to have cattle, that's because I mean, it's your job to take care of them. Whether you own them or somebody else does. Pollard's cattle's got the next one. Do you ever get any cattle out of Minnesota? No, I don't. I think I got a tractor out of there one time. Uh, my neighbor bought a load of cows, Gelby cows, and I don't know if they came out of Minnesota or Wisconsin. I think it was Wisconsin. They got here December, uh, middle of December. It was 70 degrees. It was last year at Christmas. And those cows wanted to die. Uh, you know, they had been in snow for two months up there. And they got down here in New Mexico. And they wanted to die. I honestly thought they were going to die. Uh, it was horrible. I took... The guy who owned them was here, like, the day they came in. And then he just went on vacation. And... <laughs> So I had him, and uh, yeah, he went. You know, it wasn't like he just ran. He had to go see his family. It's, that's why they were here because someone had to take care of him. I put him under that receiving barn and uh, and just took care of him because they needed shade. You know, it was seventy degrees. Those they had to have shade. Uh, about two days of that, and they uh, finally started doing really well. So, but it was pretty bad. Oh, then we got, oh man, Frank Kokoski, Kokoski, probably Kokoski. Did you have a good year with your custom mowing and bailing? Well, we totaled the swathers, so that sucked. Uh, 
there wasn't much custom baling in the spring because uh, it was super dry and just there just wasn't really much wheat out there to bale. Uh, silage was looking pretty bad. Turned out really well. Uh, we were more than double the acres we thought we were going to have. So that kind of saved us on that deal. I did do some baling. Uh, did some good hay grazer baling. Uh, that kind of really kind of picked us up round baling wise. Uh, as far as custom farming, I mean that, you know, we didn't do a lot of it. We lost quite a bit from the year before. But, you know, is it is what it is. It's custom. You're either going to not have time to do any of it or you're just going to be sitting around twiddling your thumbs. So it was a year. I'll, I'll say that. It, it was it was a year. Uh, we've had, had better and definitely had a lot worse. But as far as repairs and stuff, I mean, the swapper ate up some before it was totaled. Because we rebuilt, that was the thing, we rebuilt the header on that swapper in the spring. We dumped, God, like 12 grand into that header rebuilding it. <laughs> Two months in, just, just totaled it. And then we went through, whoo, two rentals, two or three rentals. I mean, they were just junk. I think it was two. You want to talk about some bad vibes on that deal. That was, the first one was a mess. We got accused of hiding what we hit. Didn't hit anything. Uh, somebody just didn't put it back together right. So after after all that, and then uh, the second one had a bent cutter bar in it, so that was great. Kept taking out idler bearings. Uh, that was just a hoot and a half. Uh, just it it was a pretty dumb year for swathers. There's always next year. So bailing did a lot of good round bailing. Uh, Dave Roerbra, I'm sorry, I'm just going to apologize now. Uh, Will, I watched your videos for a long time. Thanks for sharing with us. Could you tell us about that old IH and mixer wagon you started out with? <laughs> uh, I don't, there's not a video of it, but there's some pictures out there on somewhere, Facebook or YouTube or not, or Instagram. I, uh, I didn't own it. Um, I, I inherited the issue with it. So when we went into a drought and, uh, a year into it, there was a 966. We decided we were going to try to be more efficient with feeding hay. And we, we did not know how bad the drought was really going to get, but we, we bought a 966, had a loader on it, took the loader off. It was a pile of junk. Uh, and then bought a, a vertical mixer, which is fine for what we were doing. Uh, a harsh 750 tornado. They made 12 of those. Uh, and it, and it was, there wasn't a mixer anywhere. And it wasn't, you know, we didn't want to spend a lot of money. Didn't, my dad didn't want to spend a lot of money. The tractor was like six or $7,000 and the mixer was like $7,000. Well, so, fed some cows, long story short, uh, cows went somewhere else because it just it was terrible. Uh, so the tractor and mixer is sitting around and nothing to do. I'll just buy some calves and start feeding some calves. Uh, and I started out with that mixer. The tractor was a pile of junk. You, you couldn't pay me. You couldn't pay me to buy a 966. Don't care. You couldn't pay me to do it. I hate them. I hate them. Found out the mixer, the old Artsway Manufacturing built it for Harsh. They only made 12 of them. Harsh, the guys who worked at Harsh wished that they had never put their name on the side of it. That thing was a pile of junk. Uh, it ran, it was okay for what we were doing, except for, uh, it lost all the bolts that 
around the planetary gear, so we had to pull the screw out. But somebody had done it before, so they welded the top of that screw to the planetary drive shaft. So you had to pull the screw, the planetaries, rebuild it all. Big mess. Uh, that wasn't the big problem with it. When I uh, put a set of scales on it so I could actually know what I was feeding, uh, that was a huge, stupid process of putting new load cells in it. Come to find out wasn't the issue is when they built this mixer, this is your mixer, and it had a uh, set of tandem axles under it, but they were on a walking beam, so, so they would kind of do like this but they only had load cells on the back ax or on the back tire but they were had their spindle in the center so anytime you went over a dip your weight would fluctuate because you'd have weight on the front but you wouldn't have weight on the back and so it just never read right uh i don't know if the things ever read right probably not i they should have had the load cell in the center it were now the the box sits up off the frame and they have the load cells from the box to the frame that's how they do them and they work but this one didn't work so i fed three semi loads of calves didn't know anything was right it was a first actually i take that back uh earlier the first set of calves i ever fed was with that mixer and that boy lost some money. Uh, I told, you know, it, it was a deal when we started out. I'm like, I, I'm not going to, I don't guarantee you anything. Like, we can try to do it. I'm going to do it. He wanted to do it. Um, and another person wanted to do it. And all three of us lost money. Uh, the cattle market also tanked. Uh, we started out with like $1.65, went down to $1.30 all during this time. So not only did not only did we lose $0.30 cents on the market on those steers, I have no idea what we even fed them. The cost of gain was through the roof. Uh, corn was like $8 at the time. It was stupidly expensive. And I was feeding a potato silage ration. So it was it was a mess. Uh <laughs> it was I lost so much money on that deal. It wasn't even funny. Oh man, they everyone lost money. <laughs> it was so bad. <laughs> I, I I hate that stupid mixer so much. We I I sold it uh the guys who work on my mixers bought it and the guy he was like he finally told me one day he's like man it took me like three years to get rid of that pile of shit <laughs> I, they should have just scrapped it i guess it was a it was a mess and you know i got rid of it because like the last month that i had all those calves the tractor just the injection pump went out uh then it popped the you know the tractor just died like it popped the head on the tractor so no that, that was later on i take that back i had that tractor another year uh i just bought the truck because i just wasn't making like it just the scales weren't gonna work i finally hit a point where it wasn't gonna work it was it was never going to work and i finally just bought the truck that i have now and uh came from the same dealership actually it came out of Costa Grande Arizona uh from Jamie Dykstra equipment so that's where they came from and and to be fair when we bought the mixer it was like just send us something we can feed our cows it wasn't never like send us something we can build a feedlot with yeah feed truck was great compared to that uh, thing Oof. anyways <laughs> I <laughs> oh, uh, there's some things you just want to forget about. Oh, but it got me started.
they got that little that little bug just burrowed deep in there and now we just no, we can't stop now daniel's cattle are you still doing custom backgrounding and do you charge yardage feed cost or pounds per gain there's something i've talked to quite a few people about if you're going to custom feed cattle you do not guarantee gain. You do not guarantee death loss. If they want you to guarantee either one of those, it is not worth feeding them. doesn't matter. It's not worth your time. Don't do it. You cannot afford it. So I charge, uh, I think, industry, I mean, you say industry, but I, I think standard yardage is 35 cents a head a day. Uh, some people, some people do that for the entire time duration that the cattle are there. You know, some places they have to for bedding and stuff like that. Um, some, and that's feed and that's, you know, with feed markup. Some people are yardage, feed cost, you know, maybe 5% markup, uh, they're making their money on their yardage, which is fine. You, whatever works for you. Um, I do a flat rate yardage, um, and I based it off of, I had one guy, and I really liked it. They kind of, you know, they charged X amount of dollars. They charged like 50 cents a head a day for 50 days, 55 days. And the reason why they stopped there is because... By that point, the cattle were eating enough feed, they were making money off the feed. And it's it's a good model to have, I mean, it's a good business model, because if they are eating a lot, you, you are making your money off your markup. As long as you have your silage figured right, and you're not, uh, you're not missing your shrink on it. I mean, you can lose money on feeding people's cattle for them. But, uh, and then some people charge you know, per day, uh, you just have to, I had this conversation with a guy the other day. You just have to make sure you're not going to lose money and you have to be, I mean, you, you can be fair about it. I try to be fair about it. Uh, but you know, if, if the yardage is covering you and you can cut them a break on the feed, great. Uh, if you're making the money off the feed and the yardage covers your your uh, your expenses, great. You just kind of, depending on the, like if you're doing a small volume of cattle, then you'd probably want to do yardage plus, you know, like daily yardage plus feed cost. Oh, Dustin McCade. How many cattle you run and what you like to see for daily gain? Uh, I run what people, however many they want to send me. And I like to keep my gain, my grower, you know, two pounds a day, two and a quarter. You know, unless, unless we want to push them. Kind of one of those deals, you know, how many cattle you have. Main farmer, can you cook a steak on the fire for the series? As smoky as it is, I could probably just hang it up here and it'd be a smoke steak. Um, then we have Price Cattle Farm. What is the ideal weight you want on calves when you buy them? And what weight, how many days do you want to keep them before... Oh, he got cut off. Probably before you sell them. Well, ideally, buy them cheap and sell high, but uh, if this thing has taught me anything, you usually buy high and sell low. That's kind of how it works out. But, uh, you know, I want to at least put a couple hundred pounds on the calf. Then we got Donnie Gray. 
Thanks for sharing your life with us. It's it's interesting. I'll, I'll tell you that because I'm not a people person. Just don't like people. So the fact that I'm doing this, uh, it's interesting. I'm gl I'm glad I did it. Uh, sometimes I have to remind myself as to why I did it. Uh, and if you don't know why I did it, uh, when I first started this, I was pretty wet behind the ears. And I'm still just as wet behind the ears as I was, but uh, I, I made a lot of mistakes. And when I do a lot of expensive mistakes, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollar mistakes, and uh, there's just, you, you can find a wealth of information on YouTube or places like that, but everyone always shows you the good side. No one ever tells you the bad side, and nobody tells you where they messed up. And so nobody wants to admit that they messed up. I've messed up. I I have messed up and messed up and messed up and messed up, and I'm never going to stop messing up. So if I can share where I screwed up, maybe somebody else won't happen to them. Uh, through doing that, I have met a tremendous amount of people. Uh, when it first happened, I mean, the, when I first doing it, it was we were. Uh, about six months after the cattle market collapsed in 2015. So, I was broke. Still am broke, but I was broke, broke then. Uh, you know, there was just a... I met a lot of people who were in the same boat. Who They would have never admitted it to anybody, but somebody was sharing, sharing it, and I got a lot of messages, and... Some of those people are still going. Some of those people aren't, and uh, a lot of some of those people. I mean, you gotta you gotta worry about uh, you gotta worry about getting uh, a phone call from their from their family that you don't want to get. I mean, there's just a lot of people in bad situations. So, gave people to talk to. I I had people to talk to. You know. Found out I wasn't alone. Found out I'm not the only one who screwed up. So, here we are. Uh, we've kind of really moved away from a lot of the personal videos of us working on things. It's just, we're busy. It's a time thing. That's why I really like doing this, because we can share mistakes. Like the, the IH tractor and stuff like that. We can, we can share those mistakes, and people might learn things. So, uh... That's why, I mean, it, why I'm doing it. Uh, I've got off on a tangent, but elaborate on your program. Curious about what you use, back treat, high risk, Kevs. Um, you know, like I said earlier, uh, we like to run Enforce because it's not as hot on the Kevs. We can give it and mass Kevs at the same time. If you start running like Pyramid, Pre-Spawns, or Boba Shield Gold, Boba Shield Gold was hot. Uh, but you, you run a, and, and those are great products. Don't get me wrong, they're fantastic at what they do. But you're giving that Kef a virus. And they're getting, they're getting sick to build up antibodies. And what happens is when those cattle are pulled off these ranches or farms or wherever they're from, and they go into a sale barn, and then they sit in a pen, and then they come here. Those cattle are stressed beyond stress. They haven't had any sleep. They're, they are stressed cattle. And what you will run into is if you give them a, a hot IBR, or BR, you know, BVD vaccine, or, you know, one of the, uh, you know, vaccines, they're going to get sick. And you can, a lot of the protocols are given, like, you know, mass stream with Drax and there's a Prevo or Zaptran or, you know, insert generic, you know, the name here. Uh, it, it just sits there and fights itself. You give it an antibiotic on a kef that's already stressed out and you don't get the results that you need. So we like to go with 
the nasal gin because you can do, use it plus give them something if they're already sick and it will work for the most part. Um, there's a lot of studies out there that say don't vaccinate them if they haven't been vaccinated for, you know, four weeks after they've been to a, a set of feed pins. <sighs> because of that one reason. Uh, if you got calves on your cows, give them Bovashield. Give them Pyramid 5. Give them Vista. Give them, you know, 2 to $4 a head. Just, it, it's, it's, it's not expensive. They make single shot vials you know i i realize a lot of people don't have working facilities you know i have doctored a lot of cattle behind a gate just get them behind it and I, i've done a lot of it by myself um and a finger that got crushed because we i had a cow that we couldn't even with our facilities could not get her in the only way to get her preg check, so I put her behind the gate. Hired hand, smashed my finger with a chain. But she got preg checked. You know, it... You gotta adapt. And it's a huge benefit if you just give them a vaccine. And, uh, but as far as them coming in, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to throw the book at them because it, it takes a lot of my options away you know, from the start, and, you know, it, like I said before, it's, it's, it's hit and miss, you know, you get calves in, you don't know anything about them, or whoever said what they did, either is lying, or they're not lying, you know, when you, oh, they've been weaned, well, is that weaned on the trailer, is that weaned two, three days, did you wait till they stopped balling after day four, and then bring them in, or have they actually been weaned 45 to 60 days? You know, random mouse. So it's it's just, what do you do? You know, so try to keep our options open. And like I said, I'm learning new stuff every day. You know, uh, and so we just try. Sometimes I think I've had sets of calves where we give them all a shot of Jackson and never touch them again. I actually have one of those sets of calves here in the yard they went through the the announcement video for this series where there's we had 16 inches of snow over three days uh just freezing temp those calves came right out of a sail barn i couldn't tell you what happened to them or where they came from or what they have co-mingled cattle went into a receiving pen where Hundreds of calves had been through the week before. You know, it's a it's a recipe for calves getting sick. It snowed on them. And it snowed and it snowed. Ran them all. Gave them all a shot of Jackson like two days after the snow was gone. Never touched them. Didn't, did not touch a single one of those calves again. We pulled one out of the pen the other day because one of our calves jumped in with it and we had to take it out. Who knows? You know, who knows if that, who knows what's going to work. But as far as what I like to do when calves come in, let them rest for a day, day and a half. They need to sleep. They need to sit down. They need to calm down. They need to have good feed, good water. Uh, we've gotten to where really good hay, a mineral, and, you know, I have mixed 30 on hand. I like putting a syrup tank out there and just, I like letting them be little piggies because they get that, that fat in there. They have that energy. I, I have seen a huge boost in those calves just in the quality of feed that you put in front of them and good clean water and just let them sit for a day then then do your job run them through give them an ibr mass them if you want to mass them or the customer wants to mass or don't do it if they don't want it done don't do it if you know the reputation of the cattle don't do it and then treat 
because here's a if you mass the cattle you're going to doctor anywhere from a hundred you know you're, you're going to doctor a hundred percent but then you're going to pull 30 to 40 percent of those cattle typically 30 35 percent of those cattle and treat them so you're at 135 to 140 percent now your death loss hopefully is going to be a lot smaller now if you don't mass the cattle you're going to be doctoring and th these are high risk calves 65 to 70 percent of those cattle maybe only 50 typically so but your death loss can be higher so you have to you know are you going to go two percent death loss at 135 percent rate or are you going to go to five to six percent death loss at a you know 50 to 60 percent doctoring rate every set of calves is different every everything is different there's i don't think we've ever run a set of calves through here that has been the same and i it's just I have a set of calves that came in. Honestly, I really think we should be at 10% death loss. If not more right now. Everything says we should be at 10% death loss. You know, we got 100, 147 calves. We've lost three. Are they going to fall apart? I mean, we're doctoring on them. We are doctoring these calves. We didn't match the calves. They're little bitty guys, and it's horrible weather. It's been they've been rained on and snowed on and wind blown. Everything I've seen says those calves should be just dying like flies. Maybe it's coming, maybe it's not. It's that's the one thing I can say. The only thing you can do is get you a protocol you think is okay and just adapt. Adapt from there. You're gonna have to adapt to every single set of calves and Hope for the best. So, we go to Mike Kennedy. I'm always ready for a settle shed video. Well, thank you. I am one of the old guys you're speaking of. I like the old guys. The old guys are the, the, old guys are the hoot. Do you have an opinion on the change in the way people buy and consume red meat as it relates to huge numbers of restaurants that are and then that's where it ends. Uh, I don't. I don't know, Mike. I wish I did. You know, some days I get to thinking that everyone just hates us, and, but I really don't know. I. It's hard. It's hard to tell, and I. I know I. I should do. They always say, you know, in your grocery store, grocery store, try to explain, you know, the benefits of red meat. Like I said, I'm not a people person. I don't I don't like groups of people. So I I try to pick out what I can from our our feeder flash, but that's about that's about where I get. Patrick Powers asks what is your vaccination program for your incoming high risk cattle? Do you use mineral and protein tubs? I've answered this. I think I have a decent program, but I'm always looking for improvements. Do you see a difference in sickness and and death loss between your... I don't know whether it was just cutting things off. It must have been. Because that's two, two in a row that it's... Uh, I bet it was wanting to be uh needed to expand it when i printed it off sorry about that guys it's two of you have done that too yeah three of you okay uh like i, said, I just explained as far as our feed going out and our vaccine uh and, and i think i see an improvement but you know next set could be different it really can alvin roundy how has your new family member changed things on the farm and ranch that the new family members just the best i i did not i didn't have the foggiest idea of how great being a parent would be uh i you know i kind of deal with uh 
you know, are we pushing this life on her? Uh, I hope not. I hope, uh, it doesn't seem like it because she really, really acts like, she, you know, this is, this is her jam. She loves animals, uh, loves horses, loves cows. I mean, just actually tonight's first night, at the NFR, we were sitting, uh, we paid the, <laughs> the ridiculous fee because we, to watch it, uh, her and I were sitting on the couch watching the, the bronc riding and uh, it was pretty good. You know, she's two, a little two and a, she'll be two and a half in February. So, uh, it's really neat, really neat. She, you know, she loves, when we were doing all of our vaccination with the Kevs before we weaned, you know, uh, I was giving them all a shot. She wanted to give them all a shot. So I, we took a syringe and put one of the little nose cannulas on it. And I was giving real shots. And she was hanging over. I was holding on her. And she was giving shots too. Uh, it's just, it's super fun. Um, and I know at some point it's going to change. But right now, man, it's great. So uh, that being said, there's going to be a new family member uh, the end of February. So, it's going to be really fun. It's going to be stressful, but so far it's a blast. Blake, advice for young cattlemen trying to make a go of it. Blake, you're going to have to be more specific. Because, I mean, that's about as general question as you can ask. And I know... You know, listen to what all these comments I've made. Pick out what you want. I mean, and I will say this. I mean, if you got some actual specific questions you want to ask me um, as to what you're trying to do, send them in a message. Uh, we get, uh, I know you can't do it on YouTube anymore, but we're on Facebook. Uh, you can send us a message on there. <laughs> we get shit messages from uh people and then we get really great messages uh we i'll tell you anything i can so just uh send me a message on there try to do it in chase rizika i know you're always dry but what's your plan for the drought next year's farmer almanac says it's going to be dry hope that cows get to 1800 dollars head and sell all the damn things that's my plan don't think that's going to happen, though. Uh, bailed a bunch of wheat straw. I kept half of it. Bought a circle of corn socks. Kept all of that. We bought that feed wagon. Uh, that big Kirby feed wagon. So, uh, all the cows, except for part of them, are on corn stalks right now. Some of them have to come off after Christmas. Those will have to start being fed. We have some grass. Not very much. Uh, we would, we're just going to have to feed. Uh, the main group of cows will come off March. Uh, and we're going to feed cows until it rains. And if it doesn't rain, then we'll be selling cows. If we can make it, make it to the end of summer. We'll s probably sell them then if... If we can't financially make it to them, then they'll go before then. But we'll probably, we'll go till we wean the calves off of them. Then we're just going to have to get rid of the cows, I guess. I don't know. It's hope that it rains. That is that is my plan, is hope that it rains. Because that's about all we can do right now. Uh, I have something. Yeah. So there's... I may have cooked some birds. I got a something is coming out of up here, and it's landing here on my stove. It might might be a cooked bird. I don't know. I, I started this before I came back in here. <laughs> there was smoke built up in here. And, uh, I just had so much going on that I really wanted to get this done. I'm like, we're just gonna, we're just gonna go right through it. 
Ryan Smith, have you built your processing barn yet? No, but it's here. I have majority of the materials. I don't have the garage doors. <laughs> Who knows when I'll get those. But uh, the steel is here. Metal's here. I've had, the, I've had the roof for this thing for like three years. Uh, it Yeah. Um, so the metal's here. And maybe just two years. I've had it for at least two years. I uh, bought it when we put the roof on the house. So, supposed to move the chute sometime this week. Got a scale for the chute here. Uh, that's a whole whole deal. That's a performance beef health stuff in here, and that's we're gonna try that. I don't know if it's really gonna work for us or not, but we're I'm gonna try it because why not? I think it's gonna be fun. Uh, so we're gonna put the chute up on scales and have it where when the cattle come through, uh, put an ear tag in there and it connects to the iPad and uh, records all of our processing. So anytime that they're doctored, you know, it automatically bills it out. We're gonna try it. So super excited. Ah, no, I'm not as excited as I was, but I'm excited about it. Uh, but yeah, so, and we do have to get the processing barn built this year because I got to add on to the house because we got a little one on the way. And uh, we got a really small house and uh, got a lot more stuff than what they had 100 years ago. So our house is kind of packed. So we got to add on to it. Uh, if we can afford it, we're going to. But I got to build that. Then I'm going to build an addition to the house. At least another bedroom or two. Or six if I can get away with it. But I don't think someone's going to let me get away with it. So David Campbell. I love the grain roller and equipment videos. Keep up the great work and go Trump go. Woo woo! Trump train! Nobody has taken the Trump signs down. This one was on a gate. I didn't want it walking off because, I mean, it's, you know, I, I'm not ashamed. I voted for him. Thought I'd, thought I'd keep it. So, anyways. Whiskey King. We've been a subscriber for a long time. A lot of these, didn't, uh, Charlie's here again. A lot of these guys have been around a long time. So, uh, Whiskey King says, What vaccine do you use on your mama cows? I have been running a nine way with no pink eye, but I'm considering changing. We do not vaccinate our cows. I, I know I've been harping on the calves. Uh, and the reason why is we don't have any heifers that we have retained since the drought that we know have had uh, a seven weight. And at one point in time, our vets advised us to not do it because they had ran into several instances where people had taken their cows that had, they had not retained as heifers, uh, from heifers, and vaccinated them, and they sloughed like 50 to 60% of the calves, uh, which would financially just ruin everything. So we don't do that. Uh, it's something that we would, uh, and most of them have like a vaccine for lepto and stuff like that into it. We start retaining heifers. It's something we will do. Uh, but with the herd that we currently have that we've put together, uh, and I know uh, I've seen, I don't think that they do that anymore, but it's not worth the risk to me. So, not not that big of a risk. So, that's something that's just not gonna not gonna play around. Charlie left another comment. Charlie's from down south. He's he's been around for a long time. Cody Ryan, how many cows do you own and how many bulls do you have? I got a bull for every 20 to 25 cows. How many cows I have is none of your damn business. Jeff Ramon, I, one of those guys who said Raymond forever and found out I was wrong. So, um, just cool guy. Good channel. Says yeah, should be a good time, but I didn't ask a question. I guess old Jeff's just too good for us. And that is it, guys. 
Thank you. I really, oh, really enjoyed it. Had a lot of fun. But it is the end for me. So we'll do one more this year, probably. Maybe two. Depends on how everything goes. So we'll catch you up here. Yeah. Let's get you off of here without. Well, it looks like I cracked my cracked my screen. That was fun. So there it is. Like I said, thanks. Thanks for watching. Really appreciate it. It's uh, it's always fun to do these. Wish uh, I have to get my stove worked on because can't really stoke it up like I have. But uh, I'll catch you on the next one.